In this video, we're going to discuss and demonstrate an approach to screening osteopathic structural exam, specifically the supine postural exam. This approach is useful in both the inpatient and outpatient setting and can be especially helpful in circumstances when the patient has limited mobility. As I go through this demonstration, I'm going to be putting my hands on a variety of locations from your feet and ankles to your knees, your hips, the bottom of your rib cage, all along the side of your ribs, up to your armpits, and on your shoulders and head and neck. If you feel anything uncomfortable, any pain, if you need me to stop or change what I'm doing, please let me know. Is it okay if I begin? Okay. So go ahead and lie on your back. So with our patient in a supine position, it is very important for us to position ourselves so that we can best assess any subtle asymmetry. The way we're gonna do that is by positioning our dominant eye near the midline of the patient throughout the exam. So because I'm left eye dominant, I'm gonna be positioning my left eye to the midline of the patient, and I'm gonna be walking and advancing up this side of the table so that I can position my left eye near the midline of the patient. Also important is to start from a position where the landmarks are most likely to be aligned. And the way we can do that for the hips and lower extremity is by doing what's called a hip flop or a pelvis reset. We're gonna take our hands, we're gonna make contact behind the knees, and we're gonna lift our patient's knees and hips into flexion. And then we're gonna ask them to lift their hips up to the ceiling. So go ahead and lift your hips up and then down. And then we're going to passively reposition them back to a neutral position. So we're gonna bring their ankles down and position them about shoulder width apart. Now from there, we're gonna step back again with our dominant eye at the midline, and we're gonna begin at the feet and ankles. So we can begin with static observation of foot external and internal rotation, plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, and inversion and eversion. We can then take our thumbs and contact the medial malleoli and appreciate any superior or inferior deviation. We can then perform dynamic testing of the ankles by inducing dorsiflexion and plantar flexion. And we can do that either with both ankles at the same time or one ankle at a time. And we can pick up on any asymmetry that may be present. So now we're gonna look up to the knees and the first static observation we're going to make is tibia femur angulation to determine whether there's any presence of valgus or varus deviation. We can then make contact with the tibial tuberosities, so finding the tibial tuberosities here, and then with a single point of contact, we can look up and down our patient to create an imaginary vertical line, and then we can observe any medial or lateral deviation that would suggest external rotation or internal rotation of the tibias. We can then move on to dynamic testing of the tibias by taking our cephalad hand and contacting the distal femur and stabilizing it in place. We can then take our caudate hand and make contact across the tibial plateau. And then while stabilizing the femur, we can then induce external and internal rotation at the tibia. And then we can move to the opposite side and then induce internal and external rotation and then appreciate any preference of motion on either side. From there, we can continue our assessment of the knee by finding the fibular head. So we can take our thumb and middle finger or thumb and index finger and find the anterior and posterior aspect of the fibular head. And then we can find it on the opposite side. And then first, we can observe any static anterior or posterior deviation. And then on one side at a time, we can stabilize the ankle and then pull the fibular head anterior and posterior to induce motion. And then on the opposite side, we can induce motion as well. And we can appreciate the presence of restriction on one side or the other. Now, moving up to the hips, we're gonna make contact with the greater trochanter. So because we're gonna be approaching the pelvis and a more sensitive region, we're gonna to wanna to make sure that our patient is aware of where we're making contact. So I'm gonna be pushing on the side of your hips here, and then I'm gonna be moving up to your pelvis. Uh, let me know if you're uncomfortable at any point. I'm also like you to move your hands up to here, to the bottom of your ribs, great. So now I'm gonna be moving to find the greater trochanters. So I'm gonna make contact at the lateral pelvis and then using my finger pads, I'm gonna be moving around the lateral aspect of the pelvis to the lateral hip. I can also confirm the location by asking my patient to internally or externally rotate each hip. So go ahead and turn your left hip in and out, great. And then can you turn your right hip in and out? 
Good. And then once we've found our greater trochanter clearly, then we can take our finger pads, find the superior aspect of those greater trochanters, press down and create a straight line with our fingers to pick up on any superior or inferior deviation. Then we can move over to the ASISs. I'm gonna to touch the front of your pelvis. And we can take our thenar eminences, press on the anterior aspect of the pelvis. We should be able to find ASISs pretty clearly. Then we can take our thumbs and find the ASISs, then hook underneath, create straight lines with our fingers, and then appreciate whether there is any superior or inferior deviation. We can then perform the ASIS compression test. We're gonna take the palms of our hands, find the ASISs again, and then we can either press the ASISs posteriorly and medially together to appreciate tension at the sacroiliac joints posteriorly, or we can press them one at a time and judge whether we find restriction on one side or the other. And now we can test myofascial rotation of the pelvis by taking our thenar eminences, finding the anterior and lateral aspects of the ASISs, then allowing the rest of our hand to drape across the iliac crest. And then using each hand, we can lift the iliac crest anterior and across to induce rotation. So from the left side, if I lift and move it to the right, I'm inducing right rotation. If I lift from the right to the left, then I'm inducing left rotation, and I can appreciate any obvious asymmetry in motion. From here, I'm gonna move up to the inferior margin of the rib cage to appreciate diaphragm motion. So I'm gonna let my patient know that I'm now moving to a different sensitive area uh, so that they're aware of where I'm going. So now I'm gonna make contact with your rib cage. I'm gonna be moving your hands down to the front of your pelvis, and then I'm gonna find that bottom edge of your ribs, okay? So let's move your hands down here, and now I'm gonna be finding the bottom of your rib cage. So we can use gentle contact at the epigastric area to find the inferior margin of the ribs. Once we find the inferior margin of the ribs, we can take our thumbs, place them along that inferior margin, and then allow our fingers to drape across the lateral aspect of the ribs. Now from here, we can statically observe any obvious rotation. Then we can ask our patient to take a deep breath in, take a deep breath in, and we can observe excursion of the diaphragm. We can then test myofascial rotation of the diaphragm by making a slightly more lateral contact and then allowing our fingers to drape along the contour of the inferior rib margin. And then we're going to lift the rib cage on each side to induce rotation to the opposite side. So lifting from the left to the right, we can induce right rotation. And we can lift from the right to the left to induce left rotation. And then we can observe any obvious asymmetry in motion. From there, we can assess translation of the rib cage. So we're gonna be making contact up to the axilla, so we're gonna to wanna to make sure that our patient is aware that we're gonna be approaching this sensitive area. I'm gonna be making contact along the side of your ribs and pushing all the way up into your armpits. Let me know if anything's uncomfortable or if you need me to stop, okay? So we're gonna begin our contact at the mid-axillary line, and we're gonna be using the hypothenar side of our fingers, and then translate from lateral to medial, and try to appreciate any obvious restriction we feel as we approach the axilla. And we can do that superiorly, we can also continue inferiorly, and any areas where we notice obvious restriction, we're just gonna keep that in mind. Now we're gonna move up to the head of the table to assess the shoulder girdle and head and neck. Now that we're at the head of the table, we're gonna begin our inspection of the shoulder girdle by using the head of the humerus to determine any anterior or posterior deviation or any superior or inferior deviation, and that will be either through pure observation or through gentle palpation if necessary to determine the position in space. We can then move to the thoracic inlet to both observe its position and test its motion, but since we're gonna be making contact along the shoulder girdle and posterior aspect of the neck, for patients with longer hair, it's helpful to move that hair out of the way to not obstruct what we're feeling and also to prevent us from pulling their hair. So can you lift your head up and then we can take our hands and sweep their hair up to the top of the table and now we have a clear area to work with. So now to make contact with the thoracic inlet, we're gonna take our thumbs and we're gonna reach back to where we expect T1 and rib one to be. And then we're gonna take our index fingers and find the medial aspect of the clavicle, allow our fingers to sink posterior to the clavicle near where we would expect to find rib one. Then we're gonna take our third, fourth, and fifth digits and we're gonna make contact immediately inferior 
to the clavicle where we would expect rib two to be. From there, we can observe the position of the thoracic inlet within our hands, and then we can induce gentle myofascial rotation by lifting from either side. So lifting from the right over to the left, we can induce left rotation, and then lifting from the left to the right, we can induce right rotation while we're guiding using our other hand. So rotation to the left and rotation to the right, and observe any asymmetry. So now we can move up to the head and neck, and we can observe any obvious rotation, side bending to one side or the other, also observe whether the head seems to tip forward into flexion or tip backwards into extension. And then we can take our hands and gently cradle the posterior aspect of the head and neck. And then here, test gentle myofascial rotation to one side and the other. Now this is not the same as passive range of motion where we're attempting to find the true end point of the range of motion. Instead, we're trying to appreciate resistance to motion as well as the quality of motion. So beginning with rotation to the left, we're gonna move slowly until we begin to feel some resistance. And then we're gonna to rotate to the right until we begin to feel some fascial resistance. And we can observe which direction appears to be easier or harder. Now as I rotate to the left, I'm feeling some extra resistance. And as I rotate to the right, it feels like it's much easier to move towards the right. So again, testing left, a little bit of resistance, and right feels a little bit easier to move.